Thanks for coming back tonight. I'm glad to see you. This morning we talked about what God requires of his true disciples, that they be dangerously surrendered to him, relinquishing both control and fear, that they would be willing to become seriously disturbed about the evils in this world, so much so that they are willing to leave the comfort and give up their very lives if he asks it. And we said that Jesus said that those who are his true disciples will also become gloriously ruined to the point that they're willing to make him visible in a world that doesn't understand him. But here's where I want to continue it. As surrendered and disturbed and ruined disciples of Jesus Christ, he, we're not supposed to then go it alone. In this missions conference that you're studying this week, it is not about what you as an individual can do, even though that's where we started. That's the beginning place, but it moves from there. And it moves from you being a lone ranger, deciding that you're gonna go and single-handedly save the world, to understanding that you are part of something much bigger than yourself. And that is, you are a part of something called God's church. And he expects that bands of surrendered and disturbed and ruined disciples will gather together in his church to make a difference in this world, to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ, to hold each other accountable for these commitments, to give each other strength and the courage that it needs to live these, these radical lives of service, to, to link arms together in a spiritual battle that can threaten to take us down if we're not careful in this fight against evil, against the darkness that we've been talking about. We are the hope of the world. You are, as part of Christ Church, the hope of the world. And to start off on that tonight, on that theme of looking at God's church and how it is not just you as an individual who is supposed to go out and save the world, but you together collectively as part of his church in local churches serving around the world, I want to give you two competing views of the church. Um, one of them is from my favorite idiot, Mr. Bean. And um, as I show you a quick little clip of that, I'd like for you to kind of look for the stereotypes about the church. Okay, I couldn't resist. See, the church that's portrayed in this video is what most people think about church. It fits every stereotype from the stone building implying that church is 
cold and dead and out of date to the few little white-haired parishioners scattered around implying that church is for weak old people from a sermon that's so boring that within seconds, if you were to watch the whole clip, I mean seconds, it even sounds like the Charlie Brown teacher, wah, 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 and he starts falling asleep, implying that the Bible has nothing relevant to say to anybody today, and a church member who so openly disdains Mr. Bean and does everything he can to keep from smiling at him, looking at him, um, doesn't want to touch him, and even actively moves his body away from this disgusting wreck of a human being called Mr. Bean, implying that church is really just for the people who have it all together, for the people who are on the A-list, for the people who have it all together, certainly not for the broken or the poor or the sick or the idiots. Hope of the world... Not really. But let me show you a different picture of the church. And at first, you might wonder how in the world this is a picture of the church. But this is a picture of the church in what God intends for it to be. Watch this. I cry at that point every time. It's my favorite movie. Absolute favorite movie in the whole world because it says what the church is to be. It's not a weak and wimpy little thing that's cold and heartless. It is a group of people who have linked arms together in preparation for the return of the king, who link arms, the little, the hobbits, the old Gandalf, the weak, the strong, those who are with it, those who are not. And we race out together in the name of Jesus and we take on evil, not in our power, not in our strength, and some will die. Some will lose their lives. Not everybody came off of that battlefield alive. But everyone understood what was at stake. Everyone understood what the cost was. Everyone understood what the risk was to let evil go unchallenged. That is what the church of Jesus Christ is. And you are a part of it. And so when you talk about missions this week, understand that when you think about the world's problems, they're gigantic. They're huge. They can absolutely lay you down, make you go down on your face when you start thinking about how bleak and how strong the power of darkness is in our world. Very true. But we are not alone in facing the darkness. We were not meant to face it alone. And it's not unconquerable. God wins. God wins. And we will win. But he expects us in the meantime, to fight evil, to push back the darkness in much the same way these incredible, this fellowship of the ring did their job in pushing back the darkness. But I have to tell you, as I travel the country speaking to college students on college campuses, I hear a recurring theme, and it's this. Why the church? Does it really matter? Why can't I just start my own 501c3 and go out and save the world. The church doesn't get it. The church makes mistakes. The church doesn't care that people are dying physically. The, care, the church cares that people are dying spiritually, but the church, my church, you could say, doesn't care that there are hurting, broken people in this world. And I'm so tired of banging my head up against a wall. I'm so tired of trying to get the people in my church to understand that we're supposed to be his hands and his feet. I'm tired of it. They don't appreciate me. They don't appreciate my ideas. They think I'm young. They think I'm foolish. They think I'm stupid. They think I'm only here for a short period of time. Why can't I? I just bypass the church and go about as a believer in Jesus Christ and do good in this world. That would be as silly and as futile and as useless as one of those members of that gigantic army deciding that they were going to fight Mordor by themselves. It wouldn't work. It will not work for you to bypass the church. It will not work. God doesn't have a plan B for getting his work done in this world. He has put all of his eggs in the basket of the church. The church is it. The church is who Jesus died for. The church is who God loves and has on his heart. The church with all of her faults and failures and warts and hang-ups and the fact that it's made up for broken people like me and like you can be a cause for discouragement, but there is no plan B. Please, I beg you from the bottom of my heart, from the word of God that you begin to learn, to understand, to love passionately the church of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. 
So I want to spend a few minutes with you talking to you just a little bit about the church, why it matters so much, why it's vital to getting done God's work in this world that you're here to talk about all this week. First of all, the church was envisioned by God. The Bible makes it completely clear from the beginning of Scripture that God is a relational God. He has always wanted to be in relationship with his creation. And so from the moment he made Adam and Eve, he longed to be with them. He, wanted, he walked with them. He spent time with them. And they blew it. They blew it. They broke his heart. And then God created a chosen people called the nation of Israel, and they were to be his special possession. They were to be the nation that he got to commune with in a way unlike he did anybody else. There was intimacy in the relationship that God had with Israel. If you look at the tabernacle and the temple and you study that and you see the intimacy, God came near. Israel had a God who wasn't <laughs> off in a distance, who wasn't an idol of stone or an idol of wood. Israel had a God that was personal. And yet Israel blew it in much the same way that Adam and Eve did. And the Bible says that she even prostituted herself, even worshiping those idols of stone and of wood. And yet God always had something in mind. And it was the church. And after Israel failed, God, not his plan B, but in the fullness of time, brought about through Jesus Christ, the church, a people who, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, would become an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's possession. Always, always what God intended to be an intimate relationship with his people. The church didn't exist in the Old Testament. You only see it in the New Testament because in the Old Testament, his specific, his chosen people was a specific nation. But as we sing tonight and as Revelation tells us in, ver in chapter 7, verse 9, the church is bigger than one nation. It's composed of every nation and every tribe, every language and every people group. It's so much bigger than a specific nation. It is everyone in the world who will name the name of Jesus Christ. Well, so if God envisioned it, but it wasn't present in the Old Testament, when did it come into being? Well, Jesus established the church. You're going to see the role of the Trinity, what each member of the Trinity had in establishing the church. God envisioned it, and Jesus established it when he was here. In Matthew 16, 18, you know that passage where Jesus said, I will what? Build my church, and the gates of Mordor, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. When Jesus said those words, though, the church was not yet in existence. He said, I will build my church. It had not yet come into existence, but he promised it that it would. He clearly claims the church is going to be his own. It's my church, he said. It's my church. It's my possession. It is my special, loved group of people. And he will keep it from being destroyed. So God envisioned it. Jesus established it. And the Holy Spirit did his work in energizing the church when it came into being. In Acts 1.8, again, you've probably got that memorized, but it says, But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will, become, you will receive power and you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. It's still in the future. Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven and the church is still not yet present. He said it's coming. Ten days later in Acts chapter 2, when that very scared, frightened group of people who had been his followers were gathered, locked away, afraid of what was going to happen to them, locked away in an upper room, were there praying and fearful of what was going to happen. I love the way it's described in the Bible. It just says in Acts chapter 2 that suddenly the door was thrown open in this room that was locked. But suddenly the door is thrown open and a rushing wind comes and fills the room and flames of fire sit on top of the heads of every person in that room and yet they're not burned, they're not consumed. Where else do you see that picture? Burning bush in the Old Testament where God guided with the fire. Any place you see that fire where there was nothing burned, it's God. So the presence of God is on these people and they began to speak in languages that they had not learned and at that moment... The church of Jesus Christ finally came into existence. In that moment, the Holy Spirit, who had been promised, and up to that point had only come upon people for certain acts of service, like with Samson. Um, he came upon, the Spirit came upon him and then was gone. 
But now suddenly with these flames of fire on the heads of those people who were gathered in that locked upper room, suddenly the Holy Spirit indwelt each one of them and the church of Jesus Christ was born. The Holy Spirit created it in that moment from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amazing. God always dreamed it up. Jesus paid for it and envisioned it, and the Holy Spirit brought it to being through the power that he brings. And the result of this, now here's the part where it really gets so interesting to me, because the result of this new entity that was created, the Church of Jesus Christ, something instantly changed in daily life. The ethnic hatred that existed between Jews and Gentiles was wiped out. It was gone. It was never to be again. And the implications of that, why that's such a big deal, is because it reveals to us in that simple elimination of hatred between two groups of people, between the haves and the have-nots, is that it shows us exactly what the church is supposed to be about, what we are supposed to be and do. First of all, in Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, it says this. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Four things from that passage, briefly. First of all, Christ broke down the wall of separation. In the temple, there was a literal wall that separated the Jews and the Gentiles. Those that were considered clean were separated from those who were considered unclean. The Gentiles or the half-caste, those who were of mixed race. So if you were clean and pure of the Jewish race, you got to be on this one side. But there was an absolute wall built between you and everybody else. And if a Gentile dared to cross that physical wall, if you stepped across the line as a Gentile, the law said you could be killed. That's how strong was that wall that separated. The Bible says that in our lives today, there are walls that separate us. There are ethnic walls. There are gender walls. There are class walls. There are economic status walls. There's the walls between the cool and the uncool, and they are just as real as that physical wall that separated the Jews from the Gentile back in the tabernacle and in the temple days. But Jesus got rid of the walls. It says he knocked it down. Well, how did he do it? Well, the second thing about it is that he made us one in him. He didn't say, okay, now you Jews, since I've knocked down the wall, you Jews have to become like the Gentiles. And you Gentiles have to become like the Jews. No, he said nothing of the sort. In instead, what he said was, I'm making a new entity called a Christian. And in this new entity where I take the Jew and the Gentile and I put them together in me, Jesus said, in Christ, Hidden in me, you who were Jews and were clean and considered near, and you who were Gentiles and far away and considered unclean, the two of you coming to me are now creating not a Jewish Gentile or a Gentile Jew, but a Christian. Something brand new. Something 
the world has never seen, a brand new person who was created. And as that identity as a Christian, it supersedes every other identity you might have. Any other ethnic identity, any other economic status that you might have, any other identity that you would claim for yourself is now superseded by this new entity, Christian. The third thing we see in this is that he showed us our equal need of a savior. The Jews thought they had it made. They didn't think they needed a savior. And the Gentiles most certainly knew that they needed a savior. And so by bringing them both to the foot of the cross, he showed them both that they were desperately in need of a savior. And because of that, they could be reconciled. It wasn't that suddenly there were the good people and the bad people. No, it was both were bad. Both needed a savior. Both could look at themselves and see that they were lacking, that they would never have what it took completely to have this relationship with God. So there was no need for pride and there was no need for shame. So those of you who have thought in any sense that you are still struggling, you may be a believer, but maybe in your heart there is still shame over what you've done, where you've been, what you've done, who you've done it with, how many times you've done it, whatever. Whatever is the cause for shame in your life, let it go. You have come to the cross of Jesus Christ where those who have never done anything horrible, quote, in their whole life, and you who may have done so many things that you hope that most people never know, understand there's no reason for pride and there's no reason for shame. We both and all come together at the foot of the cross acknowledging that we need a Savior. And because of that, we can be reconciled to each other. And the Bible says, in so doing, he made peace between those who are at war. Fourth, that allows us now to truly be in harmony together. It means that we have the same destination. It means that we have the same blood coursing through our veins. We have the same father. We have the same elder brother in Jesus Christ. We have the same purpose in life. We can now finally, finally, Put aside all those things that separate us and actually come together for the purpose of being the light of God and being his hands and feet in this world. It means that there is a, can be a release of hatred and bigotry and prejudices of every kind. In Ephesians 3.10 it says God's purpose in doing this was to show his wisdom in all its rich variety to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. They will see this when Jews and Gentiles are joined together. In the church. Let me give you a very, very practical illustration of this truth. I've been to Rwanda many times over the last five years, and probably many of you know that there was a genocide in Rwanda 16 years ago where, to make a long story short, the two ethnic groups, Hutus and Tutsis, fought each other. And the Hutus were the ones who were committing the genocide. But through the history of Rwanda, there have been multiple genocides where both sides were retaliating against each other. But in 1994 was the one that the world finally sat up and noticed, where in 100 days, about a million men, women, and children were killed. Viciously, horribly, hacked to death, hatcheted, um, so many rapes, I, I can't even count them, and about 100,000 children left orphaned. And the saddest to me, part of this story is that churches, which had traditionally been sanctuary, in all these other years of genocide between the ethnic hatred, when one group would be in, in prominence and would attack the other, and then it would verse, and it would be the other group that would attack the, you know, the Hutus and Tutsis, and the next time it's Tutsis and Hutsis, and back and forth. But the churches were places of sanctuary. And it didn't matter which side you were on or which ethnic group were you were on, if you could get into a church, it was safe. It was sanctuary. It was like ali, ali, oxen, free, free, free. You were home. You were home, and nobody could touch you. But in 1994, those rules were gone, and suddenly churches became places, not of sanctuary, but of genocide. And sometimes the, the pastors were the ones who called in the killers and said, look, they're in there. Go get them. And the churches were torched or burned. Sometimes... It was against the will of the pastor or the priest who died himself trying to keep the perpetrators out. But this tiny, beautiful little country of Rwanda began to drip with blood. And the international community ignored their pleas for help. The UN sent very weak help. And finally, the rebel forces, after 100 days, were able to come in and stop the genocide. But the country was left in ruins. The survivors were physically and emotionally and spiritually devastated. The perpetrators began to flee the country to neighboring countries like the Congo, where they still live today, lives of economic deprivation and disruption. 
but from the ruins God is rebuilding. One of my dear pastor friends there has said, we are rebuilding our country on the bones of those who died. And the messages from the church now is reconcile, reconcile. We are no longer Hutu or Tutsi. We're Rwandan. As long as we remain Hutu, as long as we remain Tutsi, the genocides will continue. This side will retaliate, then this side will retaliate, and we will destroy ourselves. If we can be Rwandans, we have a chance to become a nation again. When I was there, I looked into the faces, when I was there the first time, looked into the faces of the people that I met, and I wondered which were the perpetrators and which were the victims. And I wondered as I would meet every single person, were you, where were you in 1994? Were you one of those who did something just kind of bad and didn't ever get caught? Or did you kill people and, and nobody ever knew it? Or, or were you one of those that turned in other people? You didn't kill anybody, but you were a betrayer. And I kept thinking I'd be able to spot the, the people who had done those things. And I realized very quickly I couldn't tell the difference between the perpetrators and the victims. Because you know what? They all looked alike. And a very scary thought came to me. First of all, I could be hanging out with murderers. And that was very frightening. Second thought I had was, there are no monsters here. They're just men and women, like me, who for a season allowed evil to reign in their hearts, and they did terrible things. And what I came away with is this. Given the right circumstances, every single one of us is capable of any sin. And until you come to grips with that about yourself, and I hear you, many of you are going, uh-uh, no way, no way. I would never do that, never. And while we're at it, I would never do this, and I would never do this, and I would never do this, and I would never do that, and I would certainly never do that. And I want to tell you that the truth is, given the right circumstances, every one of us has the capacity for that kind of evil in our hearts. And because of that, it wipes out any smug self-righteousness that we have as we deal with people as we go out of this place to serve Jesus Christ. As long as you see yourself as separate from the people you are serving, as long as you see yourself as the missionary, as the person on the mission trip, on the person who is going to help, as the volunteer who has gone to help the people who are messed up. I'm not the messed up one. I'm going to help the messed up people. As long as you see yourself in that place, your help will be rejected. Because people have a sense of those who think they are better than others. It's only those who have begun to acknowledge how desperately you needed a savior and how desperately you need Christ to reign in your heart on a daily basis. It is only when you understand that about yourself and then move out of this place to serve others from that place of humility, not a place of superiority, can you begin to make a difference in our world. So is the Church of Jesus Christ a worn out, tired, used up excuse of an organization that needs to be gotten rid of? Is it really a place of people that have made so many mistakes and have so much to answer for? Yeah, it is. You know why? Because it's made up of people like me and you. It's still the hope of the world. It's still the hope of the world. God doesn't have another plan. He has rested. He has invested it all in you. You. God has invested all of his hope for good in this world, in you and in me. As reconciled people who have come to Jesus Christ, admitting our need for a Savior, admitting that without him we're toast, admitting that we can't do this on our own, admitting that we are not lone rangers capable of pushing back the darkness, but we are people who are willing to be reconciled because we are new in Christ. And because of that, we'll be surrendered to him and we'll be disturbed and we'll be ruined I pray that in your college years, you will not lose your passion for the church. Again, I see this place after place after place I go. One of the saddest things I encounter is college students who lose their faith in college. 
especially those who go to a Christian college, because it's so easy, come on, to get jaded. You're surrounded by the Bible 24-7. It's just all there is and all your classes and all the chapels and all the conferences and blah, 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 blah. And after a while, it's just so easy to think, boring. I challenge you to remain passionately in love with the Church of Jesus Christ. Do everything you can. Even if the place that you're trying to serve, even if the place you're attending church in these years is a place that undervalues you and underappreciates you and, and thinks your ideas are silly and goofy and crazy and you're just this transient college student who's only going to be here for a little while, why should they pay any attention to you? Please don't take that as being the truth about you. The truth about you is you are not tomorrow's leaders. You are today. You are it. You are it now. You're not just in preparation to serve. You're it. You are the church. You are a leader. You are an influencer. That's who you are today. And even if the place that you're trying to serve doesn't get it, don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Keep serving. Keep going back humbly, faithfully serving. You are needed in this fight, just like the little hobbits were needed in that fight, just like the old man, Gandalf, just like the dwarf, just like the elf, just like the guys who are a little bit different. Everybody is needed in this fight, and your role is incredibly important to make the invisible God visible. Let me close with a video that I want to show you of a friend of mine, a pastor in Rwanda, who understands the power of the local church and the members of the local church being the hands and feet to make the invisible God visible. Watch this. I used to tell my congregation to help people who are sick. I thought that was my only job, to preach about compassion. But what if true compassion is to put your legs in someone else's shoes, to walk where they walk, I did not have this kind of compassion before. I started to talk about AIDS at church. I started visiting people in their home. I just show up and I cannot do this alone. This is Deborah. Deborah is a volunteer from our church. God touched her heart. There are many from our church like Deborah. The body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus. This man lost his wife several years ago. She died of AIDS. Then he got sick too. Now he's at home and cannot work. He's dying but his children do not know it. What will happen to the children? The children, they are HIV positive. They don't know it yet. What do I say to them? But I can be here, touch them, pray. Then it happens. Their face will change. You see some joy in their eyes. It is good. The hope comes again. I did nothing tangible to help them. I was just there. The church began to show this kind of compassion. Those who are infected are afraid, so we held their hearts. Those who are infected feel alone, so we visited them. Those who are infected are confused, so we cancelled them. Those who are infected feel rejected, so we accepted them. We loved people who were hurting. A few years ago, I did nothing. People in my own community were dying. They were dying every day. They died alone. They died afraid. 
they had rejected by the church. A few years ago, I thought preaching was enough. That was my compassion. But if we don't do something, who will? If we don't show God's love, who will? If we don't show up, who will? God, we are your church. We're broken. We're messed up. We've got hang-ups and hurts. We've got habits that we don't know what to do with. God, sometimes we make a mockery of calling ourselves believers. Sometimes we get angry at you, Lord. Sometimes we don't understand what happens in our lives, and it just gets all jumbled up. And it seems impossible that you would have put the weight of the world in our lap. It's amazing to think that you've called us broken, messed up people to be your church. But we are. Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you that there's no room for pride and there's no room for shame. We all desperately need you. Thank you for making us one. Thank you for erasing all the boundaries and the barriers that keep us from loving each other. God, push us out into the world, into this community, back into the churches. God, I believe you have a reason for us to be together tonight that far exceeds anything I could figure out. All I know is this particular group of students on this particular night, you wanted them to know how valuable they were to you, how important they are in your church, how desperately they are needed in this battle against the darkness of evil, and how much strength you want to give them So, Lord, we bring ourselves to you. All that we are and all that we're not, all that we wish we were and all that we know we never will be, you see us, you love us, we are accepted, we're made new in you. So, God, do something here in this place with these people at this time that will ultimately change the course of the world. We dare to dream big because your church is your plan. Jesus, you are our king. And we will do more than what fictional warriors did for a fictional king. You are real. And we belong to you. And we are here at your disposal. And we will give all that we have to usher in the return of our King Jesus. Jesus.